Hi everybody, my name's Martin from Gecko's Wildlife. You might have seen me before, I do a lot of talks around the Sunshine Coast. Here today to talk about a special group of animals. Uh, they have one th or two things in common really. They're either pollinators or they're seed dispersers or perhaps, as we'll find out later, they're both. Now, it's very easy to look at a group of animals out maybe on your property or in your neighbourhood and go, well, you know, we see them every day, we don't really think too much about them, but some of these animals are doing very critical jobs in the environment and pollinators and seed dispersers are definitely two of those. So we're going to focus on a few of those today that are found locally and talk about the significance and the importance that these animals provide to our local environment. I've got here probably one of the most uh, significant mammals that does a lot of pollination because, well, in a word, they love nectar. Sugar gliders and squirrel gliders, which this one happens to be, are very much in tune with what's flowering in trees. So this is an animal that lives mostly in eucalypt forests. They need eucalypt forests because it has hollows as well as have, having a lot of flowering trees. But at the same time, it's got the ability to move around the forest and in doing so, it pollinates a lot of plants. So it's going from tree to tree and often different, um, at different times of the year, different types of trees. So it could be eucalypts one month, melaleucas or uh, bottle brushes another month. And they do all this because of course they've got the ability to glide. And there is the gliding membrane. It's a stretchy bit of skin between the front and back legs on both sides of the animal. Sort of like a wing, but not a wing. More, a, more like a paper plane, I guess. And Baby here, my favourite squirrel glider, is quite an old animal, but probably wouldn't glide very far, but certainly has a sweet tooth for nectar. And I guess the thing about pollinators is they are sweet tooths, or beaks. They just love getting into nectar and pollen and while doing that, of course, uh, they're pollinating plants one to another. And that is a very critical part of our environment. A lot of people consider bees to be the, the famous pollinators, but there are a lot of other animals out there doing it too. So let's have a look at another one. Now, this animal probably needs little introduction. There wouldn't be a property in southeast Queensland that hasn't been visited by rainbow lorikeets. And I'm using this as an example more generally of lorikeets because they all do pretty much the same thing, and that is they feed on flowers, don't you? But rainbow lorikeets are certainly the largest and most conspicuous lorikeet. And you see the flocks flying around, very noisy, uh, chattering in trees in the evening sometimes groups of you know, several hundred. And you can imagine that several hundred birds flying around the district are doing a lot of pollinating, going from tree to tree, shrub to shrub, flower to flower, and doing an amazing job pollinating plants for us. So they're doing what bees do, but unlike bees that often take a few months off in the winter, lorikeets are doing it all year round. So you'll see lorikeets at this time of year in summer, uh, they're looking for different plants fruiting at di uh, flowering at different times of the year and therefore they have to be very mobile. They have to keep following those flowers around the district. So lorikeets, critically important. Remember this, just like the squirrel glider, lorikeets need hollow trees to nest in. They don't sleep in them, but they certainly uh, produce their young in a hollow tree. So tree hollows, in other words, bigger, older trees, are just as important as flowering trees. If you're gonna plant things in your garden, think, well, this is what it's gonna feed on, a grevillea or a banksia or a bottle brush, but it's probably a eucalypt that it's going to be nesting in. Or if you've got no eucalypts, maybe time to think about putting up a nest box in a tree. And you'd be really happy with that, wouldn't you? Yeah. If you haven't seen one of these before, you're probably not alone. However, you've possibly had one fly over your property 
or maybe even land and feed in a fig tree, but never really got close enough to see what it was. Or even if you did, you probably thought, well, bizarre, not sure what it is. Well, I'm here to tell you what it is. It's a, whoa. <laughs> it's a, a rather noisy bird called a channel-billed cuckoo. Now, you're probably going, not like the cuckoos I've seen or heard before, but in actual fact, this is the world's largest parasitic cuckoo. That is, it lays its eggs in another bird's nest and let the other, lets the other bird do all the uh, incubating and hand raising or raising of its baby, then collects its young and flies off to New Guinea for the winter. Now this all sounds a bit weird, but when it comes down to why it does all these things, the diet plays a, an important role. We're now talking about seed dispersers. Now, seeds come in many different forms, and what we're really talking about here are figs. When I said you might have seen one land in a fig tree, it was landing in the fig tree for a, an important reason. A lot of the food that these birds eat, and for that matter other cuckoos and a whole range of other birds, and sometimes other mammals as well, is figs. And the beauty of figs is there's always a fig tree fruiting somewhere and they're such big trees that they have thousands and thousands of figs. So they keep these birds well fed. But of course the figs only last so long and then the bird has to leave and go looking for more figs somewhere else. And in the case of the channel bill cuckoo, it actually has to fly all the way to Indonesia and New Guinea in the winter because there's just simply not enough uh, fruiting figs in southeast Queensland for them. So they're a rather strange bird. They look a little bit dinosaur or pterodactyl-like, and they certainly haven't got a good bite, which is why I'm wearing gloves. But Charlie here, he can't fly back to New Guinea in the winter. He's uh, had a broken wing, so he lives with me. He's lived with me for a long time now. We get along well, but he's the boss. And uh, if I forget it, he lets me know by chomping on my fingers. From one extreme to the other, here's another fig eater. Much, much smaller bird. In fact, it turns out this is our smallest parrot. So if you haven't seen this, there's two good reasons. One is the size of it, it's tiny, smaller than a budgerigar. The second is it's extremely rare. So this is an endangered species. It's called a fig parrot. No surprises there, it eats figs. And just to qualify what I'm showing you here, this is the northern one from the Atherton Tablelands. But we get one here in southeast Queensland called Coxon's fig parrot that looks almost identical to this. In fact, flying around in, or seeing it in a fig tree, they probably look the same. I'm showing you this for two reasons. One, it is a very important uh, group of seed dispersing animals because the, the parrots are not only uh, feeding on nectar, but more importantly, feeding on seeds because most parrots in fact do feed on seeds. This one specializes in figs and it flies around nomadically from one fig tree to another, dispersing seeds, often sticking them on branches, which is why a lot of fig trees start growing from way up high and grow their roots downwards. But here's the problem. We cleared the rainforest and in the process reduced the habitat for these little fig parrots and now they're very, very few. Because when you're this tiny, getting from one fig tree on one property to the next fig tree on another property is full of danger. A big channel bill cuckoo isn't really worried about other birds and certainly less worried about predators. This little parrot's got everything to worry about. When you're this small, everything wants to uh, prey on you or annoy you or drive you away. So they become extremely rare, but look out for them because many parts of the Sunshine Coast, particularly the hinterland, are probably the last few places where these birds survive. And if you can do anything to help them, it's plant a fig tree. If you're on a property and you've got enough room to do it, plant a fig tree. It will be one of the most important things you do because then you will see all the birds and other animals that come in and use it. And who knows, you might be lucky enough to see a fig parrot. Okay, no guesses what we've got here. Yes, it is a black cockatoo, a red-tailed black cockatoo. There are probably three species of uh, black-coloured cockatoos that you could get locally. 
this one, the yellow tail black, which is pretty obvious it's yellow, and the glossy black, which looks quite a lot like this one, a little bit smaller perhaps and a lot rarer, but equally they're all seed eaters and finger eaters. And cockatoos like this spend a lot of time, the big powerful beak will chew through almost any seed pod, in this case a Banksia seed pod, and while they're ripping the seed pods apart, a lot of the seeds actually drop, blow away in the breeze and end up under the tree somewhere. So while they're getting a feed, they're also spreading seeds around the local neighbourhood. And then of course, once they've finished the seeds in that tree, they move on to the next tree. Now, that beak is powerful, certainly powerful enough to chew through my finger, which is why I'm wearing a glove, but you can imagine that this bird is doing a job that a lot of other animals just couldn't do. A lot of animals couldn't rip into a uh, big hard seed pod like this. So these birds are specialists and they're designed really to uh, chew their way through eucalypt forests, whether it's gum nuts or banksia nuts or some other kind of nut. Most trees produce a seed pod or nut and these birds are the birds that are designed to open them up and let those seeds go free. So do we need cockatoos? Yes we do. Beautiful birds to have fly through your property. You might see them only once or twice a year when the this particular seed that they're after is uh, ripe. But don't worry, they'll come back. As long as the tree's there, they'll be back next year. Okay, here's something a bit different, and you're probably going, hmm, what is it, a giant rat? Well, the early settlers actually did call them rat kangaroos, but I prefer to use their uh, indigenous name, which obviously was given to them long before the early settlers came along, betong. And this particular type of betong is called a rufous betong, fully grown, so they're a tiny kangaroo. That's as big as they get. Now. They're probably not a common animal in southeast Queensland, but they are, or should be, a really critical animal. And I'm going to flip a little bit here to, uh, I guess, an area, a specialist area that most people wouldn't have thought about before. This is a seed disperser, but not as you know it. This is a seed disperser that is dispersing underground fungi around the bush. Now these are spores rather than seeds, but in essence it's much the same thing because without these guys distributing these fungi spores, where are you going? Turn around. Without these guys dispersing these fungi spores, the health of the forest is going to suffer. And unfortunately, as these animals get rarer, that is exactly what's happening to our forests. Now these underground fungi, which are called mycorrhizal fungi, attached to the roots of trees. They improve the fertility of the soil, uh, they help the tree take up nutrients, and they rely on betongs, and the next animal I'm going to show you in a moment, to actually spread these fungi spores around the soils of the forest. And a whole lot of other things happen while this is taking place too, because essentially what these animals are doing is digging up the leaf litter in the soil, turning it over, allowing moisture to get underground and essentially the health of the forest improves while we have these animals. Now you're thinking, well, why aren't I seeing these? The answer is because as the forest disappears, these guys disappear, but equally we've done something that's really made it difficult for a small ground-dwelling kangaroo type animal to survive, and that is we've introduced cats, foxes, wild dogs, feral pigs, which all unfortunately uh, prey on these little ground dwelling animals. They can't climb a tree to get out of harm's way. They often can't hop fast enough to avoid a large predatory animal. So betongs are disappearing. What can we do to help betongs? Unless you've got a big property with betongs already on it, there's probably not a lot you can do on your own place, but certainly in the hinterland of the Sunshine Coast, betongs are still found in some places and ground cover will help them enormously. In other words, uh, if an area doesn't have to be grazed by stock, 
let the grasses grow, let the undergrowth grow. Um, you can imagine that even metre high undergrowth will support these animals much better than grass down to the ground level. It allows them to hide, it allows them to feed and importantly these guys build a nest. That's what they hide in during the day. So they carry the grasses in their tail to make a nest and so they need long rank grasses to build their nests with. All those things will help them and allow them to help the forest. Now for a lot of people they'd look at this and go, hmm, that's even more rat-like or possibly bandicoot-like. But again, believe it or not, this is a little kangaroo. In fact, it's got the name potteroo, again an Aboriginal word. And the potteroo is almost the smallest kangaroo, certainly the smallest in southeast Queensland. And it, again, a bit like the betong, it's not going to turn up anywhere and everywhere. These little characters are almost confined to rainforest, uh, wet eucalypt forests, gullies and creek edges and things like that. But you can imagine that going along through that sort of wet rainforest leaf litter, there are lots of fungi and fallen fruits. They particularly like fallen figs. So there's a whole lot of different things to eat, but as they're going, they're feeding on these things and then they're dispersing them around the forest floor. So they're very, very active little animals, digging away, and quite often uh, one pair of um, potteroos will have an entire little rainforest area to themselves. They produce one baby a year, and the problem is now that each of those little rainforest areas are often not very well connected, so they're kind of stuck in their little rainforest area. They can't hop across a paddock to get to a new area, this is the value of corridors of bushland. You know, whether they run along a fence line or run along a creek, connecting up the forests is a really important strategy, particularly for little animals that can't hop out in the open, certainly can't fly, and have no other way of getting from one place to another. They need our help. And of course, if it did get caught out in the open, what's going to happen? A dog or a cat would easily be able to kill this little animal. So like the betong, they're disappearing too. Everything we've talked about so far, apart from perhaps the fungi, is done by this little character here. Now it might be a bit smaller than some of the bats that you've seen around your place. This one's a little red flying fox but quite common on the Sunshine Coast. They come and they go. They often turn up around about this time of the year, uh, early winter, to feed on paperbark blossoms along the coast. Huge numbers, maybe 20, 30, 40,000 bats. And then they fly off again. As quickly as they come, they go, because unfortunately, when the nectar runs out, the bats have to run away and find it somewhere else. But regardless of that, the other species of flying fox or fruit bat, the grey-headed and the, the black flying fox, are actually a bit more uh, stay-at-home characters because they're eating less nectar and more fruit. So we're talking about animals here that not only pollinate, but they also distribute seed, particularly the seeds of figs and fruiting plants. That's the bulk of their diet. And because they can fly, they're doing it pretty much like a bird does. In fact, they're flying out maybe 70, 80 kilometres a night, feeding in different trees, dispersing things as they go. And one of the different things about bats to other animals is they chew the fruit and the pulp and the seeds up and then spit it out. In fact, I can show you some spittings right here. These seeds are being spat out every few minutes that the bat is feeding. Now you might end up with them on the bonnet of your car or on the footpath out the front of your house and go, what a mess. But imagine what they're doing across the landscape. Everywhere there's trees, particularly fruiting flowering trees, these little characters are spreading pollen, spreading seeds and germinating new plants across a whole forest. 
That's something that very few other animals can do. Multiply that several million times, because across Australia there are millions of bats. These guys are integral to our environment. In fact, it's hard to find an animal that would be more integral to the Australian environment than fruit bats. Here's one little example. Multiply it millions of times and you've got what fruit bats are doing, not just now and again, every night of the year, because these guys have to feed every night. So unlike bees, which are only pollinating for you know, eight, nine months of the year, bats are doing it every night of the year. And they're doing it with seeds, they're doing it with pollen. Uh, they're across everything. So spare a thought, the bats get a pretty bad rap, but Frankie the flying fox, pretty important character. So I hope you've enjoyed watching our uh, presentation tonight across a, a whole range of animals. And I'd like to think this is probably the most significant one. Mm -hmm.